Hello, I'm Nadia Bilchik, and talking about ramplifying today, and as I said before, ramplifying is ramping up your presence and amplifying your brand. I'm talking to the president of the Sergey Group, Janine Sergey. She also lectures MBA students on strategy and is an industrial psychologist and has a bio that you will have to check out on LinkedIn. So that's Janine Sergey. Janine, thank you for joining me to talk about managing your virtual teams more masterfully. Thanks, Nadia, for having me. It is so opportune at the moment. I mean, if you think about it, in 2017 in the U.S., only 3% of all full-time employees said that they work primarily from home. And in 2019 at the Global Leadership Summit, they predicted that by the end of 2020, that more than half of all employees would be virtual workers. And I think that was a little accelerated with COVID-19. And what's interesting is you were really ahead of the curve because you've been doing e-learning for many, many, many years. But concrete tips and advice, because this has become mainstream now and people who had never managed a virtual team before are now, where does one even begin in terms of mastering a new platform? Okay. So I think, first of all, one has to look at your operation itself from a more strategic perspective. And obviously, in the lockdown, one seen that primarily are essential workers, you've had your entire team go virtual. But now as we're moving into somewhat of an unknown space and place where we don't know how it's exactly going to emerge through phase three, phase four, and each state is in a different place. And if you work as an operation across state lines, what you need to do, you may find yourself working with either all remote or all co-locating or a hybrid mix of the two as people move in between and betwixt. So with that in mind, the one key thing before we even get to leading a virtual team is to figure out your strategy of how you're going to actually operate as a business. And that's in terms of your products and services that you're delivering or even your means by which you're going to be delivering it and even your operational processes by which you're going to be working. And it's so it's actually, so much more is what you're saying. It's oh, not a manner of just communicating virtually. It's having strategies for saying, how do we implement that? And that's something you'll come into a company and do, right? Right, absolutely. But there's some key things one needs to think about. And it, it goes across all different industries. To give you an example, I was working with a school district. And some of them are kind of going, oh, well, we've got to finish out the year and do the grades. And we don't have time to even think about it. And I'm going, are you kidding me? You have to be far more proactive. And with this particular district, I actually have to top my hat off to them. Because they're not just considering in the now, they're saying, okay, let's actually speak to and engage our teaching body in this in terms of coming up with scenarios of how we could look in the new school year and that no one is caught, you know, on left field kind of unawares and as they were in the lockdown, rather have how are we going to teach if we are totally remote? How are we going to teach if it's half the students in in the morning, half the students in in the afternoon, and how's that going to play out with our curriculum? How's it going to work if we completely back? You know, and they're actually working out their curriculum and their means of delivery and everything for each of those scenarios. And they're actually paying their teaching body to get together in task force groups to do that. And so, so they're going to have very a to execute. So if you're in a business, get people together and say, how do we actually work virtually? What is your functionality going to be? And I think talking about teachers and often because they do the work, they've got ideas about how they can do this. Absolutely. Even think of your last interview you had with Kirk Halpert. He went to one of his 35 employees and asked, how should we be doing this? And most times the people doing the job will be really creative with how they could do it given the current circumstances. So that's it. But there's something else you mentioned, which I think is so worth reiterating. And you said, it's not just about communication. Let me maybe state this. It is so much about 
communication. It's I'm in when we in the virtual world, I say err on the side of too much rather than too little. It is all about communicate, communicate, communicate. So let's take the scenario of you've got a virtual team and you have discussed the protocols that you, for example, meet once a week. Can we talk about those actual online virtual meetings? What advice and guidance, as someone who has been navigating this for many years, do you have for leaders and participants to make the most of these now virtual encounters? Okay. So I think one of the key pieces you mentioned to begin with, where you said we've decided to meet once a week. So here's the thing. Let's talk about the meeting space. You know, there's so many statistics around meetings. And um, one bit of research I saw is that meetings, the amount of meetings have increased 10% year on year since the year 2000. So much so that they're predicting in uh, that not that they're predicting, they said, uh, and she can show that in 2019 in the US, 399 uh, billion was spent on meetings. In the UK, something like 58 billion on meetings. So we're talking about nearly half a trillion in just two countries alone. And we've got to say, are those meetings worth it? So there's an initial discussion you have to have. We need to have collaboration. That's absolutely key in any sort of organization. And so we need to say, should our collaboration be synchronous or asynchronous? And obviously, if it's urgent, time-bound, brainstorming, building off each other, we need FaceTime because of either feedback, one-on-one -on -one discussions, or conflict issues, we need to have the synchronous meetings and hold that meeting. But a lot of times with progress updates, with documentation um, and working on projects where you could work in terms of status, that could be done, even with ideas, can be done asynchronously as well. Because what we are seeing, there's an incredible burnout at the moment with, in fact, um, running meetings, meeting after meeting, and people are finding they have to do their individual contributions actually at night, which is crazy. Now, just to clarify for people who are new to this language, it's synchronous, you are in person. Asynchronous is it's information that is given, but you don't necessarily have a facilitator and you don't have to be present at the meeting, right? Right. So, so do you think synchronous means you actually, meetings? when you say in person, uh, Nadia, maybe just to clarify, yes. we say synchronous is when we all on the meeting together at the right. same time live. Right. That's what we mean. Yes. And you're saying that, I mean, this isn't interesting. So if the person who's watching this goes, what are the questions I need to ask myself when I'm calling in the whole team for a meeting? That's the first question. Is this meeting necessary or could I just have two people? And exactly. Then Absolutely. Without a question of a doubt. So there should be a series of checklists. Everyone in the organization should be asking themselves before calling the meeting. And in fact, it's the same problem we had when we were all co-locating having ridiculously unnecessary meetings that go on too long with no purpose. We know that we can actually cut down the time of meetings and make them more productive by something like 80% if we even have an agenda. And do you know that there are only 37% of meetings in America use an agenda? So, so you know, you look important. at some simple things like that and it can make a huge difference. But let's talk about the elephant in the room. I don't know if you noticed on my video, even while we were talking in sort of what is like a synchronous meeting in this interview, I had someone walk behind me. Which is perfectly acceptable, right? People are so yes. fast. You know, people need to get over themselves. Now, mm -hmm. what isn't acceptable is seeing someone in their underwear in your background <laughs> lounging around. We've it had may not that. be acceptable, but it might make for very good viewing and you'll catch <laughs> everyone's attention. Janine, very interesting you say that. I just heard an interview with somebody who said the problem about being virtual versus in person is there's so much less investment on behalf of your meeting attendees. So think about you speak, you train, you get people to change locations. Now they're doing it without much effort. Ooh. And how much harder do we have to work in those meetings? Oh. 
engage people. So actually having a naked person walk with the back might just do the trick. I love that, Nadia. Okay, so let's talk about that. That's one of the reasons why in all my meetings, I make it mandatory that everyone has to have their video on. And the reason we do that is there is 4% of multitasking on a video meeting versus something like um, 67% of multitasking on a phone call. Mm. So in my meetings, we see everyone. That's absolutely key. And you spot on in terms of saying you as the facilitator, chair, leader of a meeting have to think very deliberately how you're going to work the process of your meeting to engage people. And now I don't care what platform you use. We have the Zooms, the WebEx, the Adobe GoToMeeting, Microsoft Teams. Learn the platform that your organization is using. And each of them have their pluses and their minuses. I've had to teach myself every one of these platforms. And what you need to do is use the annotation tools. In fact, we, we, in any of our meetings that I have with my own team, we do not use any meeting where you can have a talking head for a, any length of time, because then everyone disengages. So if you are gonna have to input, you have to do it in such a way that you put up a poll. So we use our polls, we use our chats, we use annotation, annotations on the screen or the whiteboard. We use reaction tools, feedback tools. We use breakouts wherever possible, because we know that if you're going to get any length, uh, any, any element of creativity or innovation, you want the smaller groups or even problem solving. If it becomes a problem solving meeting, the smaller groups are really good. So we break them up into breakouts. They have to work on things and then come back into the main room and report on it. Now you're saying something quite revelationary here, which is I think people often think of those tools if you are facilitating a seminar or you are a professional speaker. Are leaders or managers using these tools for their weekly meeting? So let's say Sadly you're a no. manager at one of the big Fortune 500s and you're doing now a virtual reality call with some of your suppliers and your other people in inventory and replenishment and supply chain. So are we as leaders learning to use these tools even at their most basic level it's another way of engaging. I think. Oh, you spot on. So some are and some aren't. So there are a few key elements around it. Now, obviously, if you've got large meetings and you're doing a town hall, you're going to do far more webinar style and the interactivity is going to be reduced. However, it should not be completely reduced. Mics will be off. You should still be using your chat or your Q&A. Just use one, don't use both. Hard to manage both. And then I would definitely use polls as well, which will get your audience engaged with you. So that's key. Now, even, and I'm so pleased you even spoke about your suppliers or your vendors, because too often we don't manage those meetings well too. Now, we know our short-term memory banks are pathetic, to say the least. We remember seven bits of information in our short-term memory bank. So by the end of a meeting, and we know most meetings take between 30 to 60 minutes, all right, how many bits of information are people going to remember? Not much. You have to be able to reinforce it. So the use of summary, as well as the fact we have to remember that over 70% of us are visual learners. So we need to have visual representation on the screen. So I do this in a variety of ways. We always make sure if we're having a meeting where there's going to either be decisions taken or action plan created, the action plan actually forms part of the screen. And I get someone in the meeting to be inputting as people are giving the information, it goes in and we can all see it. So people can't say, oh, 
on the whiteboard, on your screen. There are ways of doing it. So people can't say, oh, I didn't say that. I didn't agree to that. Hello, it's there. We all saw it. And you have a record that you can then send to everyone immediately post the meeting. I'm a great believer in very quick turnaround times of your information. But there are other marvelous tools like a mind map. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, Nadia. It's a tool that was done in the third century to map out Aristotle's uh, work, which I don't expect anyone else to do. So it's been around a long time. Collins in the late 50s and Quillian in the early 60s introduced it into organizations and into education. It's known by five different names, actually. It's known as a mind map, um, an ideogram, a spidergram, a conceptual map, or a visual conceptual graph. And uh, Tony Buzan, B-U-Z-A-N, he actually popularized it in the 1990s. He came out of the book, I think it was 1996, called The Mind Map. And really what it does, it helps in one screen, one page to visually represent all the ideas or all the bits of information and how they relate to each other. Because one of the things that is really interesting about us as human beings, we find it extremely hard to link ideas, to see how things integrate. And it's not a factor of our intelligence. In fact, I was working with a group of nuclear physicists not so long ago. The brain power in the room, phenomenal. The ability to integrate, zero. Mm -hmm. And so we need to help that. And in a meeting, if you think about it, especially a virtual meeting, people are inputting, but they may be inputting in chat, so it's disparate bits of information coming up on screen. They don't know how to link all those pieces, but a mind map actually creates the groupings on the screen for them, and everyone can see that, one, they've been heard, and two, where it links together. And then we have all the information in one place and, again, can be sent out to all participants in the meeting straight from the meeting. And Janine, these tools, I think so many people, depending on level of comfort with technology, may be daunted. So as we end today's conversation, if you could give us a summary of, if you're listening to this and you've already mastered some of these things, great. If you're listening to this and you're going, this all sounds wonderful, I lead a team, where do I begin? All right, so there are a few quick, easy ways to do. Your organization is going to have access to the rooms, meeting rooms, and oftentimes, depending on the nature of the meeting, because that's another element you need to consider, you could have meetings for different reasons. A decision-making meeting is going to look very different to a problem-solving meeting. It's going to look very different from an innovation or opportunity-seeking meeting to a strategy meeting. Can you see where we're going or a status mm -hmm. meeting? Mm -hmm. And so the way in which you formulate it and run it needs to be different. So look at the tools that your company has and get hold of your IT or even your training department, believe it or not, and see what they have accessible. Because say, for example, I just worked with um, a group this morning where we determined that their meeting platform was not going to be as conducive for what needed to happen in their next meeting as opposed to their training platform that they had. And we're just going to use it. Now what you'll also find, most organizations are building up their technical acumen in a few people. So say, for example, I'm working with Siemens, and they actually have brought in vendors who are technically savvy, and not that they're not technically savvy, but to provide them with a service who help produce in the background the technology for the meetings or the trainings or the big events that they're having. And then what's happening is they slowly trickling out those skill sets to everyone in the organization and the leader. So I'm a great proponent in the leader. Just get hold of a platform and go in and play yourself. And I also recommend have two computers open. And so you're coming in as the facilitated leader chair of the meeting and then have another computer open where you can actually see what the participants in the meeting would see because nah. those are two different views and then try out some different stuff. And then there are vendors like myself who train people how to actually run the meetings more effectively, how to use the tools. And as we well. can reach you, Janine. It's at your website is www.thesergeygroup.com. And 
as we end this conversation, just when you are in a meeting, and I think this is so important for participants as well as the leader, the fact of being present. I love that you said, keep your camera on. I think people have this idea that because it's virtual that they are invisible and they forget that actually, I like to say you're all on TV. So your tips for looking present and coming across with confidence and competence and charisma on these calls. All right, so a first key thing that is so cool about virtual folks is you only have to dress from, sorry to the gentlemen out there, from the boobs to the head, which is so cool. And the women will know it's so marvelous not to have to put on heels. So there we are. And that's kind of a key piece. You want to make sure your background around you looks still businessy like everyone knows and understands you usually at home in our lockdown in the state where I am, we're still in lockdown. And so we isolating in place where it may not be our usual setting. People understand that. And that's why it has gone far more casual than we've ever had before, which makes it so much easier. And people also want to see you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be authentic. And so if glitches happen, speak it through. It's okay. <laughs> I have a few different screens. I look and I check on stuff and I look back. That works as well. But there are some quick, quick, some quick key tips that really help. Put your camera just slightly above your webcam or the camera on your laptop, slightly above your head looking down. It makes you look better by the way and it just gives you a better presence. Make sure how you frame that your shoulders are really nicely filling the visual frame as well. Try not have backlit. You'll notice I put the blinds down and I actually have lights, even a lamp that will shine onto your face from the front or a window. You want the front light because again, we work off perceptions. If people see you in shadow, they don't usually trust you as much. So you want that lit as well. And then um, a final sort of, and by the way, you can make it work. I'm not isolating in my usual setup. I'm actually isolating with a friend. And I actually have a camping emergency box that I have lifted my laptop onto. So it <laughs> actually it. is at the right level. And, and it's absolutely fine to be creative around that stuff. But seriously, folks, there are things you can do. Please do oh, I was on a meeting. I have to share this, Nadia, with an exec team the other day. And one of the VPs came on. His hair looked like he hadn't washed it in three weeks. He looked dirty is maybe the best way I can actually describe it. And he said, oh, I'm going to shower later today. And you could actually see everyone <laughs> cringe online. So please, we've gone casual, not that casual. <laughs> Lovely. Please, please. But stay authentic. I think that's Excellent the Excellent advice, guidance, tips. Janine, Sergey, the Sergey Group. We are going to be having an increasingly virtual world. And I like that she said, first thing is to say, does everybody have to be at this meeting? Really ask yourself, is it important that everyone's here? Who needs to be here? And that great advice and guidance to learn the platform so that you can make it as interactive as possible. Janine, it has been an absolute pleasure. I look forward to many more conversations about all kinds of other topics. And your final word to navigating this virtual world, a tip of advice from Janine Sergey. Folks, communicate and please care People are looking for empathy at this time and virtual workers need to feel like they're being connected with. I always say we shape our cultures by how we show up on a daily basis because our behaviors matter, our actions matter, and the environment we create around us matters. So good luck though and stay safe and well and connected in these times. What a wonderful conversation with Janine Sergey. I hope you got as much helpful advice, hints, tips, and that's what we do on Ramplify. Talk about people who are Ramplifying or like Janine Sergey or helping others Ramplify. I'm Nadia Bilchik. For more information, please go onto my website, nadiaspeaks.com.